Hi, my name is Peter Whiteford. Welcome to my uh, presentation on managing behaviour. This uh, presentation will look at the tutor and how they can influence behaviour and learning in the classroom. This will be split up into three parts. The first part will be a discussion on the types of disruptive behaviour I currently face. The second part will be look at the causal factors and the theories. And the third part will be looking at the solutions that I implement. So welcome to the presentation. The Oxford English Dictionary definition of learning occurs when one acquires new knowledge or skills through study, experience or being taught. Learning can be achieved in different settings from different traditional classrooms, online study and webinars to one to one training and group work. In the 1998 FEDA report Ain't Misbehaving, disruption can be defined as patterns of repeated behaviour which significantly interrupt the learning of others or threaten their personal security or well-being. It must be said that I'm very fortunate that the majority of the teaching that I complete has very few disruptions. Most of the time the adult learners take an active part in the subject and are willing to learn. This may be due to the context of healthcare. The types of disruptions I currently encounter are varied and are low level. And there are several causal factors to these. Resuscitation training is mandatory and there is an element of truancy. As a guest tutor, I do not have to deal with non-attendance. However, at the end of the session, I encourage the learners to get their peers to attend in the future. Another factor that I occasionally have to deal with is lateness. When planning the sessions, I try to start at a time which is inclusive uh, for in regard to childcare, for instance. Sometimes lateness is unavoidable, especially with the workload and timings within the healthcare sector. Hospital staff have to hand over their specific patients to another member of staff before being able to leave the ward environment. If lateness is due to this, I normally deliver a short recap before the next section. On a few occasions, I've had to ask members of staff to rebook onto the next course if they have missed a large part of the opening lecture. Mobile phone usage is an issue that I rarely have to deal with. Within healthcare, the use of mobile phones is not encouraged. And in one hospital group, uh, staff are actually banned from using them. However, staff who are attending the session outside of their working day will have their mobile phone with them. Within the group of staff I teach, there are a wide variety of levels. In one basic life support session, I may have non-clinical staff, such as war clerks and car park attendants, through to radiology staff and experienced healthcare staff. Learners can be intimidated by other learners with perceived knowledge within the class, which can lead to staff remaining on the edge of the group and not getting fully involved. Another issue would be that some staff would not like to ask questions in front of others uh, that would assist their improving knowledge. This can have a deep impact on learning and is sometime, and is something that I'm always very aware of before and during a session. Another factor that occasionally occurs is actual interruptions to the lesson. When teaching the advanced courses in hospital with the senior nurses, junior nurses may require assistance with a managerial decision. Or issue. This is quite a specific hospital problem because when I teach in say a dental practice or a GP practice all the staff attend at the same time and the practice is normally closed. The only interruption I face during these sessions may be a, an occasional phone call or do a delivery. Any interruption can inhibit the learning process. And finally disruption uh, that I find is sometimes the actual subject. Resuscitation can carry quite a taboo or fear. Staff may perceive the subject positively, whereas some will have negative feelings towards it. This will depend on the previous learning, perceptions and ethical personal feelings towards the, the subject, actual real life events they've been involved with, or previous group interactions or the previous tutor. Having now identified the disruptive behaviours that occur, we have to recognise the causal factors that may lead to these disruptions. For example, the aspect of truancy may have both a behavioural and educational factor. The non-attendance by the learner may be because of an inherent behaviour towards the mandatory element of the subject. This has been expressed to me before. I really dislike these mandatory training sessions. However, the attitude towards attendance may be because of a lack of interest in the subject. 
and a lack of awareness of the educational importance or the need to learn regularly. A recent comment was, why do we have to come every year? When a student arrives late, this has a disruptive impact on both their learning and others. This is particularly important when the education is a one-off annual session. As commented earlier, the lateness could be purely environmental cause within healthcare and staff being able to see safely leave their patients. However, it may be a similar to the lateness in an educational factor with a lack of drive to learn. The fear of the subject has a large psychological factor that I face quite regularly. Learners either loathe or love the subject. It's like Marmite. I think this is because that the subject is a very emotive one. Personal experiences and real life situations may be difficult to leave at the classroom door. Resuscitation requires a large element of interaction and hands on skill work. Previous teaching experiences have a large bearing on whether the learner is motivated. The subject can be very dry and needs an element of humour and fun to allow the learning and retention of skills. Mobile phone usage is on the increase in all areas of life. People are constantly being fed news, social media and updates. This, is inev this inevitably spills into the learning arena. This is both a social and behavioural factor. Lack of self-esteem and being intimidated by others in the group is certainly another psychological causal factor, one that is intrinsic to that person. And finally, environmental factors such as noise, heat, lighting and interruptions affect the learning and must be controlled where possible by the tutor. Both Cowley and Wilson discuss the need to be proactive before a session. I found that this preparation definitely influences the impact of learning and with a reduction of disruptive behaviour. Planning the lesson improves the flow and if an interruption does occur, then I don't tend to lose the focus. I have to say that I, since I started my cert ed, I have planned more lessons and have been more effective in my teaching. I find that when I know the learners and the group dynamics prior to the session, I have a better appreciation of what may or may not work with the group. As a tutor, I always try and approach the session differently, dependent on the learners. I find this flexibility a key part of my job. The subject is the same, but the way I teach it will be different and inclusive. I find this reduces the fear factor and allows learning to take place. Having clear aims and objectives enables both the tutor and learners to set clear goals that can be achievable during the session. This maintains the focus for the learners. I now set a few ground rules prior to the delivery of the course during the introduction period. These include turning mobiles to silence and finding out who is on duty that day. During the session, I'm more aware of who may be called away and interrupted. I've always arrived early to set up my session, making sure all the mannequins and equipment is working. I utilise the horseshoe pattern with chairs so that all the learners can see the demonstrations and aim to keep the heat to an acceptable level. All of these proactive measures help to establish an environment for learning. However, sometimes I have to be reactive to the distractive behaviours. Although this is seen as after the horse has bolted, there are measures that I found work. If a learner is not motivated, I will try and create a learning atmosphere which attempts to connect with the learner. As discussed earlier, I try to make all sessions relevant to the needs of each individual learner. As discussed by Petty, there are seven key short and long term reasons that students want to learn. From this list, I can identify at least three that I try to harness in my sessions. What I am learning is useful to me. I find I usually make a success of, for my learning and this success increases my self-belief as a learner. I find that the learning activities are fun. If the learner is intrigued by the subject and therefore gains knowledge and self-esteem from completing it, then the, that reactive response during the session should reduce the boredom and improve relevance. I utilise humour during sessions to put people at ease as well as creating a non-threatening classroom. By asking scaffolding type questions to the group as well as utilising practical demonstrations and videos, I find this approach prevents learners from switching off and increases interest. If I notice that a group or an individual learner is not attentive, then I react to this by acting tar asking targeted questions or mo move to observe what they're doing during the practical session. I find that this firm but fun approach works well in an area of andragogy. During these sessions, I am always attentive and mindful of the subject. 
I have dealt with a number of situations where learners have found the subject either emotionally difficult or stressful. In this event, a breakdown in learning cannot be avoided. The author Kabat-Zinn describes mindfulness as being aware of the present situation. When this occurs, I try to maintain the flow of the session and sometimes use the experience as a reflection for the whole group. As Kuhn describes his theory of lesson movement, maintaining with itness, momentum and smoothness are evident in this approach and I take it to my sessions. Therefore, in conclusion, disruptive behaviour is something that all tutors are likely to come into contact with this, during their career. From low level talking and mobile phone usage to more severe disruptive behaviour in the classroom. In this presentation, I've examined how the tutor can have a positive impact on dealing with the low level types. I accept that I have a limited experience of disruptive behaviour. However, I believe that by taking a proactive and humanistic approach to planning and delivering the teaching, you can affect the behaviour of learners and improve the environment in which they learn. Taking a reactive stance when a disruption occurs, um, but doing so in a way that's um, compassionate and trying to find out why a learner has reacted in such a way has the greatest impact. Thank you for your time listening. I do hope you enjoyed that.